Good morning. I'm so grateful. You know, what we, if you sang those songs from your heart, that's a taste of what heaven's going to be like. I mean, we get, sometimes in worship, you just get so enraptured with the Lord and to think that we'll have that for eternity for those who, who are overcomers, you know, and, and cross over. And I'm just, I just sense the presence of God here. He's already, what I, what I hope to accomplish with this message, I think the Lord's already done. So I could probably sit down, but I still have the message to preach. Um, I want to speak just quickly before we get into the message to the, to the man Pastor Steve was talking about, about, and maybe that's probably most men here, about being in that place of wondering, is this thing really going to work? When I came here, you know, I had a history of, I had been, you know, I'd done Teen Challenge and done, so I, I knew that I could stay free in a program that forced me to stay free. I knew that I could at least accomplish that. And so coming to Pure Life was hard for me because I, you know, for one thing, I was full of pride and there's all these other things. But for, another thing was, I, I, you know, me and my wife both knew I could go to a program and not do the things I was doing as, as long as I was here. And the fear was when the walls come down, you know, and I go out into the world, what am I really going to do? And I was, um, I was just yesterday, uh, I spoke at a, a men's breakfast about an hour away from our house and shared on purity and worldliness and things like that. And on the way there, I passed by um, a, a company that I worked for after I left Pure Life. I wasn't able to do ministry. I had been stepped down. And when I graduated, I didn't know if I'd ever preach again. I, I was just, I didn't know what God was going to do. I wasn't necessarily expecting to get back into ministry. And um, I, I got a job at a call center. We're doing insurance work. And um, this building was there. And so I'm driving yesterday morning, early in the morning on the way to this breakfast. And I passed by this building. And I just, the Lord just brought me back like, you know, 10, 12 years ago, however long it was. I was there for four years. Um, just that, that a, a, a trail for employees to walk, a nice little place around a fountain, and just remembering the conversations I had with the Lord walking around that trail, and, and not having any idea what God was going to do, and, and having all the questions that you have of God, is this really going to, am I going to be able to do this? Um, for three months during while I was working there, I was actually not even at home. I had to move back home. I lived with an aunt and uncle because my wife was like, you're not coming back until you prove that you, you can do what you said you could do in the program outside of the program. And so uh, those prayer times were during that season of like not having any clue, Lord, am I going to, what, what am I going to do for you? Am I ever going to preach again? You know, what am I, is my family, are we going to make it? Am I going to be able to actually walk this out? I mean, all the, the natural questions. And what I realized over the last decade is that when you keep your eyes on what you can do and yourself, like all of us will be, you know, hopeless and depressed and walk out of here because we've proven what we'll do in our own strength. And that if you're looking at that, then yes, you probably should walk out of here pretty skeptical of whether or not you can walk it out. But what I underestimated when I, when I think of what has happened over these years, you know, we have walked through intense challenges. We've walked through seasons that pushed me to the end of myself. We've walked through temptations and trials. I mean, it's not been an easy path walking, uh, trying to walk this out. But I underestimated the grace of God in the moment when I needed it the most. And what I have now, the advantage is I have the track record with the Lord of walking through times where I've thought, if I ever walk through this, I don't think I can make it. And seeing how the Lord has been there in those times and has brought me through, given me grace and strength that I could have never planned for. And now I just have the, the history of like, when something happens, I now I don't think like, oh, I don't think we're going to make it through this. Now it's like, okay, the Lord has brought me through all of these other things. And some of those things I thought I couldn't make it. And now I know he's going to do the same. And so it's just taken time. But I want to just testify to you, like, the, get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on the one who brought you here. And he can do it. He's, I was listening to a song on the way here. Is great. He's been faithful in the past. He'll be faithful in the future. He can't help but be faithful. It's who he is. And, and, and all you have to do is just continue to surrender yourself to him. You won't do it perfectly. But if your heart is right, as Pastor Steve was saying, if you have something real in your life when you walk out of these doors, you can walk out there in the darkness of this world and walk through all the temptations and trials. And, and Jesus can bring you through and he will do it. If you'll just allow him to do what he wants to do in, your, in this season here and continue to just say yes to him when you walk out of this place. It's, 
It's um, the devil likes to convince, like just put so much fear in our minds about, you know, all this stuff that, well, what about this? What about that? How, well, and, and I've just seen time and time again, God's faithfulness is greater than anything that the enemy can bring against our lives. And so I want to, I want to pray. Um, obviously we're going to Revelation 5 this morning, but I just want to pray and, and thank the Lord for how he's already been ministering here. I know during worship, you know, many of you, I'm sure this were uh, connected with the Lord and, and I want to thank him for that because he doesn't have to do that. I was reading a Psalm just in the quiet time about the condensation, the condescension of the Lord, how he comes down to the lowly. You know, he doesn't have to, he could, we could worship our brains out, you know, scream our, and he could do nothing like the prophets of Baal on Carmel, you know, and nothing happens. And, and he, he's justified in doing that. He didn't have to come in, into the chapel like this and minister to those of like, a bunch of broken men, you know, all of us here. And so I just, I want to thank the Lord. Father, I do. I, I want to say thank you this morning, Lord. I don't want to just rush into the next thing and, and not take time to acknowledge that you're here, Lord. Your Holy Spirit is here. Lord, that there's many in this room that have been lifting up worship pure from their hearts, Lord. Maybe, maybe six months ago or two months ago, it wasn't pure and it was just ritual. And now, Lord, you're, you're bringing life into them, Lord. And, and I know you're pleased with that, Lord. I know that's why you're, 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 you're here in this, this, this campus, obviously because of the prayer and the atmosphere that's set, but because you like to be here, Lord. You, you love the, the cry of the broken. That's what your word says, Lord. You come lowly uh, to, to help the oppressed, Lord. And as men raise their voices in this place, Lord, you love to, to hang out here with us, Lord. And, and we want to acknowledge that, Lord, that you are, you are God and you are on high, and yet you, you dwell with the lowly, Lord. You dwell with the broken. And you're here this morning, Lord. And I thank you that when you come, Lord, you, you come with, with, with not just your presence, Lord, but in your presence there is, there is opportunity to receive what we need from you, Lord. There's your grace and your mercy and, and, and all the things that we need, Lord. Everything that the, the, the men in this, uh, these seats need, Lord, comes from your presence, Lord. That breakthrough they're crying out for comes from your presence. And so I know when you're here and you, you manifest yourself in a place, Lord. You're, you're doing miracles among us, Lord. You're setting free the captives, Lord. You're doing what your mission statement is. You're destroying the works of the devil, Lord. It's what you do, and so this morning, it's, it's no different, Lord. And I, I pray just for that faith, Lord, that Pastor Steve talked about, Lord, that you would give all of us in this room, God's staff and students and visitors, doesn't matter who, give us that faith that's real, that we can hold on to, God, that's not placed in anything that's, that's frail or faulty, not in ourselves, not in a system or even a program, God. Let us have that faith that's in you and you alone. That, that, that faith that if we have it, Lord, we can truly walk through the darkest of trials, the most difficult times, the, the most worldly society, Lord, but we can hang on to that faith that we have in you. God, give us that, Lord. Birth this in it. Birth that in us, Lord. Increase our faith, Lord. Whatever, whatever prayer we need to pray, Lord, we want that, Lord. Whatever that, that thing that we're talking about, that keeping power, that holding, that, that thing where you can, you can keep us protected, Lord, we want that in our lives, Lord. We cry out for it this morning. And Lord, as we get into this message, Lord, I pray it would be more than, than just words on a page, Lord, and, and just words out of my mouth, Lord. Give us a glimpse, Lord, of what, of what you're trying to get through these words, Lord. That we could walk out of here with a sight of Christ, Lord, a sight of the glorified, risen Jesus Christ as he truly is, Lord. And we thank you for opening our eyes this morning, Lord, helping us to see what we need to see. And, and we just pray for your anointing this morning on the message in Jesus' name. Amen. My, my message title this morning is just simply, Worthy is the Lamb. We've sung it in multiple different ways, a beautiful time of worship and um, we, we've got our minds hopefully fixed in that way, but I want to, I, I know the last couple of years we've gone through this Life of Christ series and we've talked about through all the gospel stories and hopefully all of us have gotten glimpses of Jesus maybe that you've never had before, seen who he is, his character in a, in a fresh and new way. And this morning I just want to uh, talk about this, this uh, passage that really just talks about the majesty of Christ. I hope that all of us will walk out of here just with a fresh appreciation and a picture of who he is. I think the Lord wants to do that for us. Yeah. If you think through human history, you know, there's, there's been billions of people walking on the earth um, since the time of Adam and Eve. I mean, uh, uh, we, there's no way we can, you know, it's a countless number. 
And among those, there's people who have popped up on the, on the, on the scale of like, uh, you know, fame or notoriety. And not everybody gets a chance to do that. You know, if you think about in American history, politicians like uh, George Washington, you know, that's a common, everyone knows his name, Abe Lincoln, these kind of people. Um, Winston Churchill would be a name like in the political realm that probably everybody in this room has heard of and, and knows something about. Um, you think about people who've done amazing things, Mother Teresa, you know, if you ask people on the streets who's a really good person, they might throw out Mother Teresa or Billy Graham, who did a lot of good more recently. Um, you've got these people with incredible intellects, you know, like Albert Einstein, um, uh, modern day Elon Musk, you know, these people that have these like colossal intellectual abilities that everybody can probably, you know, name. There's been military commanders, Napoleon and, and all these different people, Alexander the Great. And these are people that, you know, just names that have risen up above all the rest of humanity that when we talk about these things, they, you know, people can identify. Um, there's, there's people that are famous for terrible things. You know, Adolf Hitler would be a name that everybody can, uh, you know, understands who he was and is known. And, and all of those names, they're, in, in a sense, those are great names. Because they're, they're names that have risen above, that people can, uh, you know, if you talk to most people on the, at their dinner table, they can say, oh yeah, I know all these things about this person. But the Bible tells us that God gave Jesus a name that was above every other name on the earth. In Philippians 2.9, God has highly exalted Jesus and he's given him the name above every other name. There's no name that you could name out of human history from the beginning till today that's, been, that's even close to being as great or greater than the name of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 17, 14, he's called the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, meaning there's nobody, all, he has all power. It doesn't matter how powerful, popular, prestigious somebody is, Jesus Christ, that name is above every single other name in all of human history. Peter tells us in, in 4.12 of Acts, he says that there's no other name given by which men can be saved. And so I want to talk to you about that name this morning, about the, the, the name that's, that's above every other name. And I think we get a picture of it maybe better in, than any other chapter in Scripture. Revelations 5, one of, my, uh, one of my favorite passages. But the book of Revelation, you know, we, we often uh, call it, it's a series of visions that John has, but he opens up the book and says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's one revelation, and Jesus is seen from the beginning to the end all throughout it. And the chapter before uh, uh, Revelation 5, we have Revelation 4, where John um, is brought into, he gets this vision of the throne room of heaven, which is this, is, we can read them. We can read through it, and it's hard for us to really grasp what, you know, there's no way we can really get our human minds to understand what he's trying to express. But he sees God sitting on the throne room. There's these elders that are sitting around him, 24 elders on 24 thrones. There's lightning and thunder coming from the throne of God. There's a sea of glass before the throne, and then there's these, these crazy, hard-to-imagine living creatures that are crying out, holy, holy, holy. And it's, just, it's this otherworldly uh, picture of what ha what's happening in heaven right now, worship going before the throne. And as those beasts, the, those creatures are singing, holy, 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 the elders are falling before their throne, casting their crowns before the one on the throne saying, you are worthy. That's, that's the picture of, of what John is seeing in, in Revelation 4. In Revelation 5, he, it's like he zooms in on one aspect of what he's seeing, and it's this scroll or this book that's in the hand of God at the throne. It says in verse 1 of Revelation 5, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Now these seals, we'll find out, we're not going to talk about it today, but as you read the Revelation, those seals, every one of them unleashes an aspect of the judgment of God on the world. And so when John is looking at this, he's understanding that those seals have to be broken even though... Well, you know, from a human perspective, those seals, when they break, terrible things happen on the earth. And so they seem like a bad thing. But it's actually the way that God's going to bring justice to sin on the earth. He's going to make everything right by bringing final judgment. And he's going to take over, basically, in charge of, of human history at that point in time. And so it's a good thing. Like, like the, he, somebody has to get that scroll and open the seals. Or human history is just going to continue on the way it is. And, and none of us can agree that would be a good thing. And so there's a lot at stake at opening this scroll, and, and that's why this is so important. And so in, in verse 2, it tells us, uh, it says, A strong angel proclaimed with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book 
and to break its seals. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or even to look into it. It's this picture of this. It's like they get together a search party and they're like, we're going to travel the world and we have to find somebody who can open up this scroll. And they're looking through all everybody who's available and there's not a single you know, king or ruler or president that has enough authority um, you know, and has risen up to a certain rank that he has the right or she has the right to say, I'm going to open up the scroll. There's no person that has that power. There's no wise person or inventor or anybody who has, you know, even with the most amazing human intellect, no one has the wisdom to be able to figure out how to open up the scroll because no one's worthy to open it. There's no rich person, you know, you think about the, the, the most rich billionaire on the earth that probably thinks they have all the power, I can do anything I want because I have all this money, but no rich person can buy the right to open up that scroll because no one is worthy. No angel can do it, no, there's nobody. And John, in verse 4, he begins to weep over it. It says, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Now, son, John here is looking and, you know, he begins to weep. And one commentary suggested he might be thinking, you know, sin on earth will, is never going to be dealt with now. And so it's like this hopelessness of like, because no one is there to, to break the seal, like we're stuck, we're trapped forever, you know, in, this, in the way that things are. And this angel tells him, listen, don't, don't weep. One of the elders tells him, don't weep because there is one person. There's one who's actually worthy. And it's the one who's the, from the line of the tribe of Judah. This is a reference back to Genesis 49. You remember Jacob gets all the sons, the, the, the 12 sons who will become the tribes of Israel, and he, he blesses them. He pronounces a blessing over each one of them. And he, he says this over uh, Judah. He says, you're a lion's cub. This is verse 9. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? Verse 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nation shall be his. Here Jacob is, is pronouncing this, this prophecy, this prophetic blessing over Judah, saying that one day someone from your lineage is going to be someone that the, the nations will become obedient to, that there's a scepter in his lineage, and we understand that points to Jesus Christ, who is of the tribe of Judah. The elder also said that he had to be the root of David. This is in response to uh, Nathan's prophecy. Uh, You remember David wanted to build the temple, and God gives a word to him and says, you're not going to build the temple, your son's going to build the temple. But Nathan pronounces to David this amazing uh, covenant in 2 Samuel 7, 16. He said, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so both of these were understood as prophetic Um, uh, prophecies about the Messiah that was coming, that he would be of the tribe of Judah because of the prophecy came from Jacob and that he would um, be a descendant of David, which is why many people during Jesus' ministry, as we've seen, as we've talked through the Gospels, were crying out to him, have mercy, son of David. It was a messianic title saying they were were tying Jesus to the person here who was going to fulfill this prophecy. And it's this, this, this beautiful picture. The elder tells John, there's no need to weep because even though we could, there's no one that can be found on heaven or on earth. Nobody's worthy except there is actually one. It's going to be the one who's from the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of Jesse. And they're going to go, they're finding this one. He's in the throne room here. And it talks about the lamb that's going to appear here that we're going to see starting in verse 6. It says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and gold, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you are slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. It's hard to exaggerate the importance of this moment, you know, that, that, that 
the, the, the one thing that needed to happen now in this, in this vision that John's seeing, they've identified, oh, there is one. And this lamb appears who, who looked as if he was slain. And he takes that, you know, in the moment that he takes that scroll and all of a sudden, you know, all of heaven sees like there's one who's worthy and he takes this scroll into his hand. And they, they burst into this like ecstatic new song that they sing about his worthiness. And they, they just begin to worship. And in that song, they say that the reason that he's worthy to open up the book and break its seals is because he was slain and he purchased for God with his blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. The word there for purchased is in the Greek. It, it, it means to acquire something by purchasing. But the stress in the Greek, it's, it's stressing the transfer of ownership from one to another. Specifically, it says in salvation that it's, it's focusing on how the believer now belongs to the Lord as his unique possession. That's what it's talking about when Jesus purchased for himself. He took us that have, had placed our faith in Christ. He took us as a possession and he took us to himself. He purchased us out of our sin, out of our bondage. And, and that's why he's worthy to open the scroll. In Acts 20, 28 we're told this, keep watch over yourselves. This is talking to a church leadership. It says, and watch the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. That word bought there has a different connotation. It's a different Greek word. It means to make one's own, to reserve for oneself with a deep personal interest. That Jesus, the, 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 in Acts, we're told that Jesus, he bought, the, the, he bought the church with his own blood. He reserved us for himself because he had personal interest. He, really, he wanted us, and so he actually he paid the price with his own blood, and he bought us to himself. 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, it says, There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. That word means to pay to acquire to pay something, you know, paying a ransom price in order to buy something. It's referring to Christ paying the complete purchase price to secure our freedom, our redemption, is what that means. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, You know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold you were redeemed from the way of life handed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That Greek word redeemed means also to restore, to buy something back. It means to rescue from the power and possession of an alien possessor. There are four different ways that the scriptures try to explain this one concept, that when Jesus shed his blood on that cross, he was, he was, there was this transfer, it, this divine transfer took place. I, I call it the most unfair trade in history. That Jesus, he, in that transaction, he gave those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, he gave us his righteousness, which is hard for us to imagine what that really looks like. And all he got in return was our sinful, broken lives. He, he shed his blood and, and you know, all we, he got our sin out of the deal. What kind of deal did he get out of you know, dying for you and I? But he so wanted us, he so loved us, he saw us in, in our, in our you know, sin and our lostness, and he said, I'm going to do something about this. And, and the, the Trinity made this decision to rescue us out of our sin just because of mercy. And his sinless blood was the only sacrifice that could work. You know, the Israelites had sacrificed how many, you know, the hundreds, thousands of animals in their time. And the Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats can't forgive sin. That was just pointing toward Jesus. But if, if Jesus had said, you know what, I'm not going to do it, there was, there's no hope for the human race. He's the, there was only one way, and it was through the sinless blood of Christ. Or if one of us, you know, if Adam and Eve had stayed living in perfection, that would have been and never sinned. That was the only other option. But Jesus had to come and die for our sins, and he's worthy to open up the scroll because of that, because he purchased for God a people by his own blood. They go on in verse 11. John says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor, and glory, and blessing, and every cre created thing which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all, the, all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing, and honor, and glory, and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. 
There's no way we can imagine what that would be, what John experienced in that moment. I mean, think of the majesty of that moment of thousands and thousands of, of these voices, you know, crying out and just pure worship to the Lord. And, and they're, just, they're just trying to express, as we did this morning during worship, inexpressible words. Like, how can you put words to what Jesus is really worth? How can you come up with the right phrase or the right, you know, adjective in the human language to be able to try to get out of your mouth, you know, something that actually matches up to his worth? It's impossible. And there's seven things here specifically they attribute to the lamb. And each one is either a picture of something Jesus has as an attribute or something he displayed through his work of redemption. The first word there is power, talking about Jesus' absolute authority in heaven and on earth. And he proved that by, being, by rising from the dead and overcoming death. All power, they say, belongs to him. Riches talks about abundance. You know, the Bible says in Colossians 1.16 that everything was created by Jesus and through Jesus. Like, the whole world belongs to him. Everything. He, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says. He, he is the one who, who created everything, and because of that, he's worthy. All riches belong to him. Everything on this earth belongs to him. It says that wisdom belongs to him. That as the author of wisdom, he, he proved himself. You know, he gave us this amazing book full of godly wisdom, and, and he proved his, himself to be completely wise in the way that, they, that he and the, the Trinity put together the plan of redemption. He's worthy of strength. It says all strength belongs to him, talking about not just having wisdom, but being able to, he had the ability to actually accomplish redemption for mankind. Honor means that he should be highly esteemed, that we should honor him as equal with God, that, that he lived a life, a sinless life. We should look at him, and he's, an honor, he's honorable. All honor we should give to him. Glory is the word doxa, which means God's infinite intrinsic worth, that, that all of heaven right now is giving him glory, and he deserves glory from us because of what he accomplished. One commentary said about the word blessing, to bless God or to ascribe blessing to him is that the state where the heart is full of love and gratitude and where it desires that he may be everywhere honored, loved, and obeyed as he should be. Many of us experienced that this morning, a heart full of love and gratitude as we gave him blessing. And, and the, the Bible just tells us, oh, these are just some adjectives that they're trying to use to describe what Jesus is worth, why he's worthy, and trying to worship him with those words. And this is what's happening in heaven right now. You know, all of the focus is on Jesus. Everything, and, and this is what Christianity is supposed to look like. This is, a, this is a picture of what our internal lives are supposed to be every day. And we can, the, the amazing thing is we can join, you know, with the, the heaven right now with those words. We're going to sing a song at the end of this service. We'll have a chance to join in. We did it this morning. To join in with what's already going on in heaven right now as human beings, frail human beings in all of our weakness. We can join in with this amazing worship, you know, concert, whatever you want to call it, this worship service going on in heaven. That's, that's a picture of the worth of Christ, but I think oftentimes in the Christian church, maybe especially in America and the West, we lose sight of this because we have created a Christianity that's really not about him but about us. We often, you know, we, and, we do, and I, I'm guilty of this. We, we preach this to people. We do altar calls and say, you know, Jesus will forgive your sin, and he does forgive sin. He'll give it peace and a purpose. He's got a plan for your life. He wants to bless you. He wants you to go to heaven. We... we, we we say those things, and even though they're true, it's kind of a one-dimensional thing. It's all about what Jesus can do for you and I. Instead of what you and I have an opportunity, I think the, the greater thing is what we, and I, what we can give Jesus because he's the one worthy of it. You know, the, the reality is you and I should repent and fall down at Jesus' feet and worship him for our entire lives, even if we got absolutely nothing from him out of it. Even if he, he, he didn't do anything for us, no blessings, you know, nothing. And at the end of, the, at the end of your life, you knew you'd have, you'd, your life would be no better off for it. Jesus is still worthy of the worship that we, that we oftentimes, you know, deny him. He's worthy because he's worthy. Not, not our emotions and our attitudes, they don't play into his worthiness. He doesn't stop being worthy because you walk into a service and you're too tired to worship and suddenly he's, no, he's worthy because of what he has done. He's accomplished, you know, redemption for all of mankind and heaven right now is worshiping and we're the only ones with enough pride and selfishness and ego to think that we can walk into a place and, and say, well, I'm not going to worship today because I've had a bad day. I had a bad phone call this week. I'm mad at my counselor. And so somehow like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to enter into worship. That's crazy. 
Christianity's never been about what we are supposed to get out of it, but what He gets out of us because He gets glory when you and I serve Him and worship Him and obey Him. That's what He's looking for and it's what He deserves. There's a story from a, a group in the Czech Republic. You're probably familiar with the name, the Moravian Community. Um, they were most, uh, most well-known because they had a, a, a movement and they had a, year, a prayer movement for 100 years of nonstop prayer. That was kind of their legacy. And in that movement, they, they launched this massive missions movement around the world. And all these amazing things happened through that community. There's a story that I've heard before. Um, it's, always, it's always ministered to me about these two young boys who um, they had heard about this island um, where this atheist had, had bought an island and they had like 3,000, 2 or 3,000 African slaves that they had brought there. And the British owner of the island basically made this decree that we're never going to allow any religious minister uh, to come. No Christians are going to come because we, they, don't want, they didn't want to hear about Jesus and they didn't want their slaves to. They're like, we're, we're like an atheist uh, plantation or whatever. We don't want anything to do with it. And so these two young boys, in this, they're in their 20s, young men, they're in the Moravian community, heard about this, this tragedy of like, there's going to be two to 3,000 people living on this island with no witness to the gospel. And so the story is that they, they, they basically presented themselves to the owner and they were willing to actually sell themselves at a slave's price in order to get to that island and they were going to sell themselves into slavery and just live there with the people so that they could share Jesus. And so the story is that, that as they, they, they boarded the boat, they did this and they were heading toward this, this community that their family was sitting on the shore watching, you know, the boat slowly going by and these two young men are getting ready to basically never come back. They're going to go to this island and this is like where they're going to end their lives eventually. And the story is that these two young men, they linked arms and they raised their hand and they shouted to the people on the shore. They said this, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of of his suffering, and the Moravian community made that their missions, like their motto. That's what they were known for. They have it on a flag with a, a lamb on it. That that they realized missions wasn't just about going out and reaching other people. Missions was about Jesus receiving the reward of what he suffered for on the cross. And it's it's this beautiful picture of of what you and I. This is how we should live our lives. That re, with the realization that that. It's not just about what we get from Jesus. He's so good. He blesses us. He gives us all these things. He, he sets you free from sin. He gives you a new life. All those things are true. But if that's all you're in it for, you're missing out on really the main purpose of why God brought you here. It's to, to get worship to himself and to receive the reward of why he died. He deserves that worship in Re Revelation 5 that as the lamb slain and the only one worthy to open up the scroll, he deserves that from us. And that happens every time you and I, when we give our lives to Jesus and we obey him and we are redeemed and we sit here in chapel and we sing to him and we, we, we you know, worship him throughout our lives, like he gets the reward. And that's the, that's the bigger picture of what's going on here. When a man comes to pure life and they're full of sexual sin and darkness and spiritual pride and they sit in these chairs and some of you maybe you just got here and, and that describes you and you're sitting here and it's like, when, as the process takes place week after week and the Lord chips away at you, this, I just described this to those men yesterday about how the Lord brought me here and, and began to show me my life and show me my heart and it was like day after day till I got to a place where I finally laid it out, down and I gave it to the Lord. Like, that's how he's, he's actually receiving his reward for that. That's what he died for. And I guarantee he looks at this place and he's like, I love Pure Life Ministries because I'm getting my reward out of the men that are getting free here. So you say, well, what does all this really have to do with me personally? You know, like what, this season, I, I want to share three thoughts about this, about the worthiness of Christ that I think will be helpful in a more practical way. It goes along with what I've already said, but the first thing is just that simply this season is not about you. It's about the one who's worthy. I know most of us, probably all of us, come to this program, and that we're thinking we're going to Pure Life Ministries for us. We're, we're going to, maybe your wife or your pastor told you you needed to go, and so you know, you're like, okay, I have all this stuff in my life. Things aren't right, and I'm going. And we come to this place thinking, like, the whole program is for me. Like, I need to get right. I need to get these things together. I think that's kind of a natural way to think about it. But I want to encourage you to think about a little bit differently. I don't think God brought you here just for you. He brought you here for him. 
You're here because of Jesus, because he's worthy of the reward of his suffering through your life. And yes, of course, getting free from sin and all that stuff is all part of the package. But ultimately, you're here for Jesus' sake and not for your own. You're not even just here to rescue your marriage or be a better father or whatever those things are. Those are all peripheral things and they're very important. But they're subservient to the fact that you're here for Jesus and for Jesus alone so that he can be glorified in your life. So that when you walk out of this program, you go out there and you testify like I've done in thousands of places, you know, and, or at your workplace and you go all around. And when you share, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. Other people have an opportunity to hear and Jesus is glorified in that. That's, that's the bigger picture here is that Jesus is wanting to get glory uh, for, for himself because he bled and died in order to have that. I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to the sermon, Ten Shekels in a Shirt by Paris Reedhead. It's, it's, I've listened to it multiple times. It's a classic. And I want to read a, 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 just a part of his testimony that kind of describes what I'm trying to communicate. He said this. If you, this is, uh, I think he, he traveled in the 50s, 60s. This is a, a little bit older. He said, if you'll ask me why I went to Africa as a missionary, I'll tell you I went primarily to improve on the justice of God. When I went to Africa, I discovered they weren't poor, ignorant little heathen running around in the woods looking for someone to tell them how to get to heaven. But they were monsters of iniquity. They were living in utter and total defiance of far more knowledge of God than I had ever dreamed they had. They deserved hell because they utterly refused to walk in the light of their conscience and the light of the law written upon their heart and the testimony of nature and the truth they knew. When I found that out, I assure you that I was so angry with God that on one occasion in prayer, I told him it was a mighty little thing he'd done, sending me out there to preach to these people that were waiting to be told how to go to heaven. But when I got there, I found out they knew about heaven and didn't want to go there and that they loved their sin and wanted to stay in it. It was that day in my bedroom with the door locked that I wrestled with God. And God spoke this to him. He said, I didn't send you out there for them. I didn't send you out there for their sakes. He says, I heard as clearly as I've ever heard, though it wasn't with a physical voice, but with the echo of truth of the ages finding its way into an open heart. I heard God say to my heart that day something like this. I didn't send you to Africa for the sake of the heathen. I sent you to Africa for my sake. They deserved hell, but I love them. And I endured the agonies of hell for them. I didn't send you out there for them. I sent you out there for me. Do I not deserve the reward of my suffering? Don't I deserve those for whom I die? For Paris Reedhead, that was a moment that changed everything for him, where he realized, I'm, this, I've been, uh, in my, he had a humanistic version of Christianity in his mind. He was going to go out and save the poor people that needed saved, and he missed the whole bigger picture. And I want to say that about the program here. You know, God didn't bring you here just so that you could get free. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. I'm, I'm grateful for how he does that, but it, ultimately it's about him. And when you make the program about him, you're actually going to receive everything else that you need. If you make it just about you, then you'll walk out of here and you're only going to get whatever that is. And you're going to take that humanistic Christianity and you're going to match really well in with the rest of the church. But you're not going to have that faith that Pastor Steve just talked about. But if you make this whole season about him, about making sure that whatever I do, I'm going to make sure to glorify him and give him the reward through my life, then all the other stuff gets added in. He said, seek first the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. If you seek first him and his glory and his honor, everything else comes in the package. But you're not only selling yourself short, if you, if you take that out of the equation, you're selling him short. And, and which one of us wants to walk out of here? And, and our testimony is I spent, you know, nine months of pure life refusing to worship the Lord what he's due. I don't think any of us want that. And when you realize it's about him and not about us, it takes a lot of the burden off of ourselves, of, of what we, I mean, it's like, well, if I don't, if he's the one who brought me here and it's for himself, then he's the one that has to do the work. You know, not that you don't have to do all the things that you're supposed to do, but it's not 100% solely on you that, that things happen. If you'll just turn your life over to him and trust him, then he can, he'll do the work. Because he's worthy to open the scroll. It's not about him. It's all about him and not about us. The second thing I wanted to share is that if he's able to open the scroll, if Jesus Christ is the only one able to open the scroll, then certainly he's able to set you free. The... the, the 
the opening of the scroll and breaking its seals is this mystery bigger than any of us can fully understand. You know, scholars have been arguing about all these things in Revelation for years and years. No one knows the full picture of what this means, but it's like this, this thing of cosmic proportions. It's like the entire human history rides on this scroll being opened in the seals. And so this is like a huge deal. And it, it displays Jesus' authority, his sovereignty over human history. And, and this is the one that we're worshiping this morning. The one who brought you here, the one who defeated death, sin, and Satan um, is the same one that got you into the seat that you're sitting in. And I want to ask you the question, do you really think that victorious conqueror, Jesus Christ, can't handle the things that are going on in your life? Isaiah 5, 9, 59, 1 says, Behold, the, land, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Ephesians 3.20, to him who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly everything above all that we ask or think. Jude 1.24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Hebrews 7.25, he who is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. This is the Jesus that we serve. He's, 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 he's incredible. I thought about it this way. If you are a billionaire, let's say you've got access to more money than anything in the world. You've got you know, unlimited access, and you get a bill in the mail for $100. Like, somebody who has no money, like if my 10-year-old Claire got $100, we say, well, you owe us $100. She'd be like, it would be this insurmountable thing. You know, how in the world, how many chores do I have to do, and how many birthdays do I have to save up for, like, $100 is a big deal to a 10-year-old. To a billionaire, he wouldn't even, it's like not, it's so small and minuscule, it wouldn't even like register. It's like, just you'd pay the bill, you wouldn't even know that it happened. And when you think about it from our perspective, you know, you come here and I came here thinking our sin is this mountain we'll never be able to scale because we haven't been able to. Some of us for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years have been looking at this thing and it looks like this gigantic mountain that no one can ever cross and we wonder, can God actually do anything about it? To Jesus who has the authority to open up the scroll and break the seals over human history, your, our little sexual sin problem to him, it's like, oh, that's, that's like what I do. You know, like that's like, it's not even, it, it, from his perspective, it's not this mountain that can't be scaled. He's like, I'm pretty sure that I over, o- already overcame the devil. I've already broken the power of sin and I've conquered death. Like those things are pretty big compared to like, I'm stuck in sexual sin. I don't know how to get out. And so this one who is worthy to open the scroll and, and break the seals, like the, the fact that he's able to do that, I think means he can probably handle any situation sitting in front of me. Not just handle it. He's like, he just, he, he, it's not even something that he, he doesn't lose sleep over it. You know, he doesn't wait. He doesn't like, he's not sitting here thinking like wringing his hands up there thinking, I don't know about that guy. You know, like the rest of them, maybe I could figure out. But that one situation but that's what, that's what we do. The, the devil will whisper in your ears, and he's done it already. Like, you're the one that everyone else can get it, but you're the one that won't. And Jesus doesn't think that way. He's not, he's not intimidated by our sin. He's already taken it all upon him. Like, it's already dealt with in his eyes. All he's waiting is for us is to repent and allow him to do the kind of work that he wants to do in our lives. And so I think this, this throne room vision in, in Revelation 5 should change our perspective to see, to stop seeing things from our perspective, our limited perspective, and to see it from his perspective. This season in your life feels like it'll never end, like, you know, all the questions about what's going to happen and can I really get free, all that stuff is focused on you. And if you begin to look at him, it's like you should walk out of here with some faith thinking, wow, God, he can handle this. I don't know how he's going to do it. It's going to be difficult. I got to do my part. But if I'll just do what he's asking me to do, uh, certainly, you know, he can, if he's done it for other people, he can do it for me. And so don't put your hope and your faith and your own ability during this season. Put it in his ability, the one who's able to set you free and save you to the uttermost. The third thing is that if he's worthy to open the scroll, he's worthy of our worship. Psalm 29.2 says that we, we are to ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name and worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The word worship, in, in, it comes from an old English word mean, meaning worth-ship. It's ascribing worth to something. When we worship, we're saying this thing is valuable. It's worthy of my time, my attention. That's what worship is. And we, also, we, we often think of worship 
you know, in the context of what we did this morning and what we're going to do in a moment, we think of it as singing songs to the Lord. And that's obviously an expression of worship. But worship is a whole lot bigger than just that. It's a lifestyle that you and I are called to live. The, uh, the, the, in Jewish culture, they didn't have, you know, oftentimes we, we separate things like, okay, for example, I work in a ministry job, and other people say, well, I work a secular job. We have this, like, this divide between things that are sacred and things that are secular. That's how we think of things. In Jewish culture, they didn't see it that way. They saw all of life belongs to the Lord. He's involved in everything. And so whether I'm talking to my wife or working a job or raising my kids, like everybody is a part of, of ministry in that sense because it's all worship. That's how they saw it. And, and Paul picks up on that in Colossians 3.23, a, a common verse. But whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as lurking, working for the Lord. So when you're working at Leslie's or whatever contract you've got, you know, you're working in this place or whatever, that's worship. It doesn't feel like worship, I'm sure, some days. But when you do it for the Lord, you know, when you're cleaning toilets in the dorms or whatever, if you do it with an attitude of, 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 of doing this for the Lord because he's worthy of this season of your life, like that, you're worshiping. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, if you eat or drink or whatever you do, do, do it all for the glory of God. And so there's this, this concept, I think, that's important for all of us in our culture to, to stop thinking of things of like, you know, like I'm worshiping in chapel and then I'm going to go do something that's not worship. No, when you're doing your homework assignment, when you're having a, a meeting with your counselor, you know, when you're having a phone call with one of your children, all that, it's all worship if we bring Jesus into it and do it for his glory. And the one who's, who, again, who's worthy to open the scroll, he's worthy of you and I to live, not just, a, not just sing songs on a Sunday, but to live a life of worship Monday through Saturday as well. That everywhere I go, it's an opportunity to worship God. And I think the greatest uh, point of, of worship is when it's, it's when it's the greatest amount of sacrifice. When you feel like worshiping the least is when it really means the most, when you do it anyways. It can be really hard to worship the Lord and while you're in this program because you're here and, you know, life is, everything seems like it's falling apart. Some of you are walking through hardships. Like we can only imagine some of the things you guys are walking through. And so you come into a chapel and you know, okay, this is, we're going to sing a few songs. We're going to hear a thing. And it's like one, one more, you know, thing that you just have to do to try to get yourself to the other side of this program. And so it can be difficult to set all that down and to say, you know what, Jesus, you're worthy of my worship, even if I don't feel like it, even if my life is falling apart, even if I don't get what I want when I get out of this place. You know, even if it doesn't look like the way I thought it was going to look, and, you know, I, I, I graduate and I go into a situation that was not the situation I've been praying for for eight, nine months, he's still going to be worthy. And for when you set those things down, the disappointments and the hurts and the distractions, and you say, Jesus, in spite of everything that's true about this situation, what I see with my natural eyes, I, I'm going to spend time worshiping you because I know that you're worthy of it. I think that's a beautiful act of sacrifice to the Lord. And, and he, 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 there, there's something that takes place in those moments when you worship. I, I, I can testify over the years of like, Something happens when you just go after God and worship and you don't have an agenda and you're not asking for things. You're literally just like, Lord, I'm a sacrifice and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to lay myself down right here and I'm going to worship you because you're worthy. And then he does things in your life you're not even asking for. That, 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 there's like a transfer that takes place. And so it makes, it, I understand why in the American church we, we sometimes flip things because worship becomes about us because in a way we receive in worship and it is kind of about us, but that's the, the whole point is like the perspective. We're supposed to be bringing something to God and in the midst of that we get something. But if we approach God trying to get something, we miss out on the whole package. So my question for, for you men in the program as you're walking through this season, you know, are, are you walking through this season with the, with the conscious endeavor to make sure Jesus gets the reward that he deserves out of your life. That, that looks a lot different. When I'm having a conversation with someone that maybe I don't get along with, maybe it's a buddy in the dorm that, you know, we, do we, we used to call them fruit testers. You guys still use that term? <laughs> and that person that, you know, you have a hard time showing the love of Christ to, in those moments when, when you're getting ready to say something that you shouldn't say, you know, having this perspective is going to change the way that you talk to that brother. When you start to think, you know what, I want to speak to this brother in a way that honors Jesus and reflects his worth in my life because he died on a cross for me and so he died on a cross for this brother that I'm not getting along with. 
when you're at work and you're tempted maybe to, to, to slack off or you're, you know, you got a bad attitude or have that lustful thought or whatever it is, in those moments when we're tempted to live out, out of our flesh, if we really have a perspective of like, okay, Jesus, you're, you're worthy of me thinking thoughts of you rather than thinking of thoughts of that person that are immoral. Like it just, it should change everything. And the, the, the counseling, the attitude you have when you walk into a counseling appointment, if you prayed before you went into your counseling appointment, Jesus, I just want you to get the reward of your, your suffering out of my life. How would that change your attitude when you come to your counselor? You'd be like begging him, like, please rebuke me and confront me. Like, show me my pride. Really, I'm serious. You'd be like, please, like, like whatever it takes for, you to, for Jesus to get my eyes on what I need to see, like, I want that. I, re- I remember praying a prayer that, uh, you know, here in the chapel during a week when, when I was really seeking the Lord, where this prayer rose up in me, and it was just simply, Jesus, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, do whatever you have to do. And I remember praying that, and it was real. Like, I really was thinking, if you'd strip away everything from me in this moment, all I really want is you. If you'll, if you'll reveal yourself to me, just do whatever. I don't care how painful it is. I won't resist. And, and I guess my testimony over the years is he's, he's been faithful to that. And there's been things he's stripped away from me. And he's still on a daily basis confronting my flesh. It's still a walk and a process and all these things. But ultimately, for the heart that really wants him, he's going he's gonna to prevail. And he's going to teach you how to walk with him in a way that brings him glory. And maybe this morning as we're worshiping in a few moments, that's what you need to do is pray that kind of prayer. Jesus, whatever it takes. I would challenge you to go to your counselor this week when you sit down with him across face to face and say, I want you to do whatever it takes to get my attention. I give you full permission to do whatever you see in my life that you think is, is standing in the way between me and God. Give, tell me that. Don't, don't sugarcoat it. Not that they would, but, you know, give me, like, what, that's why you're here. Why would you go through this, you know, this season and just waste time trying to resist and fight and try to, you know, do everything you can to dodge responsibility, to do the minimum in your homework, like, who, who, you're wasting not only your time, you're wasting your counselor's time and everyone else, and there's a seat there that somebody who's really hungry could be taking. Why would you want to waste your time? Why not just be desperate for the Lord? And in, in light of what we just talked about, just fall on your face before Jesus. I think maybe some people, that's what you need to do to this morning, is just get down and humble yourself. Get down on your face and just begin to praise him for who he is and, and give him permission. Say, God, I'll, whatever it takes for you to get the reward of your suffering out of my life, I don't care what you do to strip it away. Maybe someone has to pray a prayer like that.